law and order on the ballot and on This Week in South Florida. We're learning to build our cases, our criminal cases against these bad guys. In Miami-Dade, the veteran state attorney and her toughest challenge in decades in a live debate. For far too long, there has not been equal justice in Miami. In Broward, the hand-pecked sheriff runs his first election to keep the job. I promoted over 400 individuals under my command and created the most diverse executive command staff in the agency's history. The former sheriff who fought suspension is fighting to get the job back. The people have never lost confidence in me. I think the election on August 18th will show that. It's a South Florida election special this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you can join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg, heading into the home stretch of early voting and to election day. We devote this hour to some of the most watched races in South Florida, and we start with the race for Miami-Dade's top prosecutor. The two candidates are together with us today. Catherine Fernandez-Rundle, incumbent Miami-Dade state attorney since 1993, running for an eighth term. And Melba Pearson, a former prosecutor in the state attorney's office for 15 years. Most recently, she has been the deputy director of the ACLU of Florida. Ladies, good morning. Great good morning. to have you on. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning, Glenn, and good morning, everyone. Thank you. And we are going to use first names here because both Glenna and I have known both of you for many, many years. Uh, Kathy Rundle, let me begin with a, uh, I think, a serious question that's going to be asked, has been asked in this campaign. You've been the state attorney for 27 years. In that time, you have never charged a on-duty cop with murder. There is one prominent case involving a prison inmate named Darren Rainey. He was schizophrenic. He was doing two years on cocaine possession at a state prison. South Dade as punishment. Two corrections officers put him in a scalding hot shower for nearly two hours. He died. It took you five years to decide that no charges would be filed. Why didn't you file in against those corrections officers? Okay, a couple of things. Um, you know, when we watched that rainy portrait, it really was very heartbreaking for so many of us to see that. But then, you know, when you look at the science of it, what a prosecutor has to do is rely on what a medical examiner says. In the state of Florida, state law says the medical examiner for that community it is not related to me the, the medical examiner is a separate independent pathologist that conducted the autopsy on mr rainey and that determination by this expert this outside independent expert was that it was not a homicide that there were no burns on his body there were no burns on his feet which would have supported the allegation that he was standing in a hot shower. Yeah, With Kathy, that, if I may, if I may interrupt you, let me just, if I may, yeah. uh, we know Dr. Emma Lou reached that conclusion. She's a fine uh, forensic pathologist. Uh, however, a independent uh, forensic pathologist was hired by the family, and they determined that in fact uh, there had been serious burns that had caused his death. Did you just so, ignore so those conclusions? In the criminal arena, there's a much different standard than there is in the civil arena. So in the civil arena, which is a lower standard of proof, and you can, the lawyers, that's what they do. They hire experts. They, they get expert testimony to support their civil case. But in the criminal arena, our burden is much higher. Our, our ethical obligation is much stronger. We have to be able to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt based on the evidence. Kathy, and the, the, evidence was, the, evidence, excuse me, the evidence by the doctor, the chief pathologist for our community, who under the law makes that decision, was that it was not a homicide. My hands were tied. Kathy, you have used that argument, uh, be able to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, to talk about the criticisms of your office not charging on duty police officers with murders in several decades. I want to take this question to Melba Pearson. Uh, that actually, in context, is a pretty normal operation in the state of Florida. Only one police officer has been convicted in 30 years. And so using that standard as 
as um, being able to prosecute a case beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury, how would you do things differently seeing as the standards to prosecute uh, police officers criminally is very high and broad in the state of Florida? Of course, thanks so much for that question, Glenna. So at the end of the day, the prosecutor's duty is to make sure that you're seeking equitable justice for everyone. And there has been so many missed opportunities under my opponent's watch, including the Darren Rainey case, because I vastly differ uh, from her analysis of the facts. And also it is very clear that a manslaughter charge could have been substantiated based on the evidence that was made available, including the medical examiner's report. So what I intend to do differently, number one, is to create a civil rights unit. And in my civil rights unit, I will have dedicated prosecutors who only work on police misconduct and police shooting cases. Having been in that office and done the work, I know how it operates. Basically, you have your day-to-day caseload and your assignment that you have as a prosecutor, and then on a volunteer basis, you end up taking one or two police shooting cases or one or two hate crimes cases, that sort of thing. But Melvin, so the, qu the question is really, if the evidence does not rise to reasonable doubt, isn't there a an ethical standard by which a prosecutor needs to meet to, to bring a case without that standard, is, is that an ethical decision? Oh, I mean, of, of course. First of all, you cannot file a case unless you have enough evidence to prove the charges beyond a reasonable doubt, period, end of story. I, you, you have an ethical obligation, you have a legal obligation, and I've never deviated from that. But the difference is, if there is evidence, you can't say, oh, I don't know if we're going to win this case, so let me not file charges. The standard is not whether or not you're 100% going to get a guilty verdict. You can never guarantee what a jury is going to come back with, ever. Even with the most quote-unquote slam dunk facts that you can have, you still don't know that you're going to get a guilty verdict. But you have to go into it knowing that you have the evidence to prove the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. And just to put a, just to put a, a cap on, on this particular issue, Kathy, is there any case that you've uh, decided not to try that you, in hindsight, might feel differently about, may, might bring to a grand jury if you hadn't done that or may reopen? Uh, in, in hindsight and with what you've learned? Yeah, Glenna, I, you know, we're, we're, the science, I can't argue with the science in the Darren Rainey case. It's just the science is what it is. But I want to go back to something because there's two things I would like to address, Glenna. One is my opponent has said before she would just take something to trial regardless. I'm glad to hear now that she's saying that would violate ethical, ethical obligations. Number two, we have the finest teams, both look at, we have specialized unit that looks at all of these police misconduct cases. And, and we, we prosecuted over 500 police and correctional officers during that time. That's all specialized folks looking at it. And on the police shooting side, as you know, I think we're the only prosecutor's office in Florida that sends our lawyers out to the scene, two lawyers. And they, we have a committee they staff those cases. They work diligently on those cases. They're the best eyes. They're the veterans, the most experienced lawyers we have. And I call them the best team in America at that state attorney's office because they really do. So the notion that we don't have the best eyes, the best intentions, that we do the best investigations is just is, is a wrong notion that my opponent keeps putting out. It's a bad narrative to say that about that wonderful uh, group, that team of hardworking men and women at the state attorney's yeah. office. Uh, Melba, you are the reform candidate in this race. Uh, you have said essentially that the state attorney's office, where you worked for 15 years, is ossified, it's stagnant, it needs to be shaken up. Give us an example or two of where you would shake things up. Certainly. So first off, we have to start with how our young people are being treated. Uh, the Unfortunately, the office has had a very horrible habit of direct filing juveniles. 96% of the juveniles that were direct filed, which is taken out of the juvenile system and placed into the adult system to face accountability, 96% of those juveniles who were direct filed 
for nonviolent offenses between 2014 and 2018 were black and brown kids. Now, that's a problem because when we want to make sure that justice is equal for everyone, when we want to make sure that there's no inequalities or disparate treatment, this clearly flies in the face of it, especially since we know no child has the monopoly on crime. So first off, I would end the practice of direct filing juveniles, except if otherwise directed by law. Kathy, Sec can you can you put some context to that? Is that factual? Uh, and please put thank that in you. context. I, I do appreciate that opportunity to clarify that because, again, it's a, a very twisted narrative that she puts out there. First of all, um, the police make the arrests. And secondly, we, got, we must recognize that we have something called juvenile civil citations. So I just want to put some meat on this framework. So civil citations is kids get cited instead of arrested. And so that is something that we actually authored and got passed in the legislature. So we're very proud of that. Then after you have those that are cited, you then have about, let's take 2019, you had approximately 3,000 juveniles that were arrested and brought into the system. 1,000 of those automatically are diverted. The others stay within the juvenile system. The only number of cases that went into the adult system where it's 56 in 2019. So if you take the larger perspective of 3,000, you're down to such a small percentage. And yes, the law says it was mandatory um, transfer to adult court. Doesn't mean they're going to go into adult sanctions, but it means they're going to be handled and supervised out of the adult system. And you know what? King Carter, King Carter was shot and killed at six years old by a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old, an 18-year-old. Yes, we direct filed on those children. Right. And you know what? There were kids with guns who were very dangerous. We have some of those. In 2019, the 16 out of the 56 that were discretionary were ours. And six of them were charged with murder, and the other were charged with a variety of armed robbery cases, armed jacking, sex battery, meaning rape cases, et cetera. All right. So, last Kathy. Last Hold, yeah. hold on, if you will, Kathy Rundle, Melba Pearson. We're having a very lively debate here live on This Week in South Florida. We'll be back with more in just a minute. We are back with our mini debate between incumbent Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle and challenger Melba Pearson, who worked in that office for 15 years Melba, I want to start there. You were the deputy chief of the career criminal division, and as such, you would have been in the position to argue vociferously for the minimum mandatory sentences for career criminals. Next job was as a deputy director of the ACLU, where uh, an organization that is advocating eliminating those severe minimum mandatories. Where do you stand now on that? Certainly. So first, I need to go back to one thing that my opponent said. When I made the comments earlier, I stated very clearly I was looking at the data between 2014 to 2018 having to do with nonviolent offenses. My opponent spoke about a whole different year, 2019, and spoke about violent offenses, which was not what I was addressing. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Going back to your question, Glenna, uh, I am opposed to minimum mandatories in many cases because of the fact that that they result in often disproportionate outcomes. When I was assistant chief, I usually waived minimum mandatories for the majority of cases if there weren't you know, some ex exacerbating circumstances that would have required that scheme. But we also have to appreciate not everybody views cases in the same way. So we have to make sure that we're being equitable. And again, one group of people doesn't get a disproportionate impact in comparison to other similarly situated people. So that is why I'm definitely advocating for a, a definite change in minimum mandatories and focusing more on restoration, rehabilitation, using techniques like restorative circles that have proven to be very effective in other jurisdictions yeah. in reducing violence and reducing recidivism. Uh, Kathy Rundle, um, this morning, the Miami Herald, and here is the editorial page of the Herald, gives you a recommendation, but it's kind of lukewarm. Here's what they say at one point. This is not a full-throated, unequivocal endorsement of the incumbent, of you. 
Uh, her 27-year tenure has been at times flawed, at times infuriating, at times befuddling. She can and she must do better. What would you say to the voters of Miami-Dade County, many of whom probably agree with that assessment? Well, you know, absolutely, we can always do better. All of us need to always be self-examining, um, self-reflective. Communities change, problems change, and so do we as a prosecutor's office. So over the course of my career there, in, in, in addition to putting together an outstanding team that leads that office, one of the largest in the United States, 1,200 employees, over 300 lawyers, over 55,000 criminal cases, and, and, and we have a child support enforcement division that does about 80,000 cases and collected over $182 million last year, we know that we can't stay static. And so what I and our team do is every year we create something. We're either changing how we do business, we're innovating programs. And so if you look over the course of those 27 years, it's not perfect for sure. Yeah. And we make tens of thousands of decisions. And we realize that many times people aren't going to understand the decisions. And at least 50% of the time, someone's disagreeing with us. Kathy, However, Kathy, if you look I, at I, the larger I, picture, Michael, yeah. you will see that there have been a number of very important, great innovations, such as our, as our sex trafficking unit, our mental therapeutic courts, veterans courts, drug courts. These are all alternative pathways to incarceration yeah. we, that we have created. We understand, uh, excuse me, Kathy, we understand you run a really big, complicated operation. Here's just one spe specific follow-up here to what you're saying. In both the um, uh, Rainey case and in that of Edward Foster, the Homestead man shot to death five years ago, you have sometimes had these cases which go on for years without a decision. We understand the course of justice sometimes is not always swift, but why does it take your office so long in some of these cases to reach a conclusion? Well, um, those two cases, I would consider them outliers. I do not consider them to be the normal average case. And they were, one, the rainy was too long because they really, for a whole bunch of reasons, you all know, it's a 75 page report. It's on our website, you can go look at it. But really the medical examiner didn't make its determination to many years later, I believe that's accurate. In the Foster case, one of the reasons, unfortunately, that it's taking so long is that we're trying to work with the defense counsel and the family every time there's a new witness. We try to attempt to get them so that we get all the evidence to make a decision, not on 90% of the evidence, but on all the evidence. But again, having said that, those are outlier cases. The major We have streamlined our cases, Michael, and you'll see over time, especially when FDLE, which is what I advocated for and brokered for our community, once they came in and started doing their investigations, of the police shooting and in custody deaths, it went much faster and much smoother. We now have complete status reports since 2017 on every single one of those cases. Where is it going? What's the status of it? And the report is online so that everybody can see what we did and how we did it and how we reached the conclusion that we did. In the short time we have left, I want to I just want to make the point that this is a Democratic primary, but because there is no Republican candidate, this is a race open to all voters. So I, I want to give you both a very quick chance. Let's start with Melba. What, as a Democratic candidate and a progressive candidate, what do you or will you offer a more conservative Miami-Dade voter if you become state attorney? One of the things that I have been uh, hearing from different folks as I go to the different polling stations, as I travel about the county or do various forums, is that people are very concerned about public corruption. And that is something that really concerns conservative voters. And even conservative voters have a lot of concerns about policing as well, as evidenced by the diverse coalition of people that are out protesting and raising their voices around this, these issues, as well as maybe not protesting, but posting on social media or writing op-eds. So it is clear that the community is concerned about these issues. And I am the person to take this office into the next, you know, eight years, 12 years, take things into a new direction and really implement the great practices that have been going on across the country. I will say this, my opponent has built a foundation. 
but I intend to build a house and really make things better for the people of Miami-Dade County. If they want to see a change, if they're dissatisfied, as so many people have expressed, they're dissatisfied with the way things have been going for the last 27 years, it's time for a change. The people demand change, and I am the person that represents that change. Kathy Rundle, 30 seconds to close. Oh, great. 30 seconds. Well, uh, I just I would say this to the, com the community that's watching. If you want someone that has a CEO, a chief executive officer's experience in managing a big law firm and a criminal justice system leader, then I think that I am the one that you want. I'm the one that's proven that I know how to reform laws. I know how to build a good team. We've reduced the crime rate in Dade County based on our smart crime initiatives to by 70%, which is the lowest it's been in the last 30 years. That's what this community wants. They want to be safe. They want to feel safe. They want to know that we're the guardians of doing everything we hum humanly possible to protect them, their families, and their children. Kathy Rundle, Melba Pearson, always great to watch two litigators go at it. <laughs> we appreciate your time. Thanks Thank so you very much. much. All right, up next, another very closely watched race, the battle to lead the BSO. The current and former sheriffs are both with us today, and Scott Israel will be up first when we come back. The Broward Sheriff is certainly more than just a lawman. He is the CEO of more than 5,600 employees, a budget of close to a billion dollars. And to get elected a politician of sorts as well, the front runners in the race for Broward Sheriff have made it contentious from the start. The current appointed sheriff against uh, the former, who the governor suspended in the wake of the mass shooting at Douglas High School. And both are here with us today. And we begin with that former sheriff, Scott Israel, who tried unsuccessfully to get the job back through the legislature and the courts. And now he is asking voters to reinstate him. He joins us via Skype from Davey. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning, uh, Glenna. Good morning, Michael. Thanks for having me on. We are glad we are glad you were here. Yeah, you know, um, Scott Israel, I've known you for a long time, uh, and the voters, more important, the voters of Broward County know you well, and they're familiar with your record. They elected you uh, to this office once before. Uh, why should they put you back in, given what happened at Fort Lauderdale Airport and at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High? Sure, we've talked about that be this uh, before. They should put me back in because of my record. Uh, we had an exemplary record. We never had a scandal. There was no corruption. Um, unlike my opponent, I I've been truthful uh, with the people, transparent. I brought body cameras to South Florida. Uh, Michael, I think I've done more than any leader to blow up the schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline, which mainly uh, through civil citation kept black and brown kids out of jail. And as, as, as I said before, you know, I have just about every big endorsement. The Sun Sentinel endorses me. Um, there was uh, uh, five people died at the airport, a horrific day. But the men and women in law enforcement at the Broward Sheriff's Office, the FBI, FDLE, we work together seamlessly to criticize what happened out there is, 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 really, uh, is really shameful. And at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, uh, we've talked about that and talked about and talked about that. But in the words of the special magistrate, who was a, and is a Republican, a lifelong Republican, uh, a state representative, a lawyer, um, he said, quote, the evidence offered has not demonstrated that Sheriff Israel be removed from office. So let's can well, we talk. Let's talk a little bit more about that, because really this whole race, fair or not, is enveloped by likely caused by that massacre in February 2018 at Stoneman Douglas High. Uh, so you have said that you have not done anything wrong. Uh, the governor removed you for what he called incompetence and negligence, which you've been fighting from the get go. But for what went on there and at the airport and you were the sheriff, you you've also said leaders lead. So doesn't the buck stop with the sheriff, which would have been with you? The, bu the, the buck stops as far as responsibility, fixing problems, 
But uh, do we expect Governor DeSantis to resign because so many people in Florida died of COVID? O only if he is the cause of it or could have done something different. Uh, there's nothing that myself or any other leader could have done to prevent Parkland. Uh, the policies, the procedures, as Dudley Goodlad and Bob Gualtieri said, the policies, the procedures, the equipment, it wasn't a training issue. We had a deputy who was scared to go in. It was, a, it was an issue of courage. And he was eventually charged by FDLE for not going in. They said, FDLE said, he had the policies, he had the procedures. BSO provided that. Uh, so to say, I mean, there have been 191 kill active killings in the United States of America. And the public knows this. I've been talking about this for the last two years. So reconcile, to reconcile one thing first. The, the day sure. you filed for re-election, uh, it was in August. You filed for re-election, and that very same day, the Commission on Florida Law Enforcement Accreditation had announced that they had voted not to renew the accreditation for the Broward Sheriff's Office for the first time in 20 years because of failures in that office. That was a, uh, Glenna, that was a continuation of a Republican conspiracy. It was a sham. Greg Tony purposely did not go up to Tallahassee to fight for the agency. In November, before I was suspended, in November, um, and you heard the testimony, you came up to cover it, and we all appreciate that. Uh, the Commission on Accreditation gave us glowing reviews. They gave us, a, a, I think it was called a platinum rating. They said everything was exemplary. And then seven months later, a group of Republicans meets, and they decide uh, to overrule the commission. This has never been done before. It, it was a conspiracy. It was a farce. It was a sham. And Greg Tony was part of it. Yeah. Uh, Sheriff Israel, I need to ask you about a allegation that Sheriff Tony is making in a television ad that is running in South Florida. He says that, you, well, number one, he says you didn't hold your officers accountable for their misdeeds. But then he goes on to say that you yourself were accused six times of using excessive force when you were out in the field making an arrest. Were you uh, accused of using excessive force and what happened to those uh, cases? Thank you. Uh, I was accused six times of excessive force. I think these were co complaints were made by between 1983 and 1985 when I was a young officer working spring break in Fort Lauderdale fighting with intoxicated college students. Uh, every complaint was made by a white male and every complaint I was exonerated. In that commercial, you see a, a excessive use of force during his tenure. It's, it's a fake commercial. Uh, he wants to come in as the, the, the knight in shining armor for police to fight police brutality. When he brought mixed martial arts training that the Broward Sheriff's Office deputies call ground and pound, you saw the, 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 the telling sign of where two of his deputies got out and, and they pummeled Luca, uh, DeLuca Roll, a 130-pound uh, kid who was at school in Taravella. And he doesn't, or he doesn't fire them right away. He waits six months. He berates the Tamarack Commission. Then he goes ahead and berates the state attorney for not checking with him. Yeah. Um, well, Scott, still I, I, I need to interrupt and simply say, and we're going to hear from Sheriff Tony in just a minute, but he did discipline and fire one of the officers who had manhandled the Luca roll, pushed his face into the ground. So it's not as if he sat back and did nothing. No, he sat back and did nothing. It wasn't until six months later, Michael, until after uh, Marsha Ellison and Roz Osgood and Benjamin Crump marched, and after he found out from his campaign people that we were quite a bit ahead of him for polling in a minority community. Uh, you know, this and this race is not only about that. And I wish, you know, this this station, Channel 10, and thank you for allowing me to be here. You've twice, this station has twice offered Greg Tony and I to debate live. And I hope you'll back me up on this. He's purposely backed out of debating me. We should be on the screen together right now. But he wants to go on by himself so I can't check him and I can't call him into task for murdering a, 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 a teenager and lying about it, for using LSD and lying about it. He's in being investigated, as I speak to you, by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for untruthfulness. 
everything he's about to say is going to be untruthful. And I, I wish I could be there. I wish he would have had the courage to debate me so I could refute everything he's about to say. Well, aside from a debate, you have just taken that opportunity. And since we <laughs> speak with him next, we will give him that opportunity as well. Scott Israel, great to see you today. And thank you thank for your you. time. Great to see you. Stay safe and uh, fit best to your families. Thank, thank you very much, Sheriff. All right, up next, yes, Sheriff Gregory Tony is going to join us live. After the governor suspended Scott Israel from office, he appointed Gregory Tony, who had been a sergeant with the Coral Springs Police Department and then in private business teaching active shooter training. Sheriff Tony joins us now by way of Skype. Sheriff, how are you? Good morning. Great to see you. Thanks for being with us. Hey, Sheriff. Good morning. And if Good morning, I can, both of you. Thanks for having me. And if I can jump like right into it, um, the yeah. biggest criticism against you both this morning and for the past four to five months is uh, your perception that you have been untruthful from either a sin of commission or sin of omission, not putting down on your applications for law enforcement from the get-go, the fact that there was a, a murder when you were a teenager in Philadelphia. Uh, however that panned out, it was not on your application. Um, how, how do voters deal with that? And especially since then, the supervisor in Coral Springs in hindsight said he probably would not have hired you for your first job there. Yeah, Glenn, I heard the, the allegation uh, in the statement that Scott made to accusing me of murder. And the reality of it is this was a self-defense case where an armed murder suspect who had witnessed kill two people pulled a gun and stormed into our home. Fair, fair and enough. And I don't, I don't want to litigate this particular case because you're right. You are free and clear of that. But how do voters handle that you did not disclose that? That's really the question. There, sure. There was no obligation for me to disclose a childhood trauma where I didn't commit a crime. Uh, I've talked about this in public, in church, and as mentoring, uh, and sharing this information with people to inspire them. It's not a matter of whether I, I did, had an obligation to disclose it, and the whole public knows it's not something I'm shameful of. It actually asks on the application yeah. if you had ever been to court, have, or, have ever been arrested. It's a very broad question. Um, the answer with what you have told us sh should really have been yes, factually. That's not true. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania, if you look at all the different legal aspects of what they require and what's stated in their court system, that's not true. Uh, so it's, again, a matter of opinions that has been expressed about as to whether or not I should have mentioned this. Um, Sheriff, again, sort of a corollary here at the beginning of this year, you filled out an, a sworn affidavit for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and said that you had never had a criminal record sealed or expunged. But that wasn't true either. Yes, it is. In terms of me completing those forms accurately, I had no obligation to mention about a, trial, a, a childhood trauma where I had to kill an armed suspect on every single application I filled out. And I've completed the FDLE and the FBI, and I still have all my secret clearances related to being able to do this job. If there's any wrongdoing, then those things would have been removed. Sheriff, you were brought to office really on a, a great wave of grief and anger over the massacres at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Since then, in the two years, this commission had been formed and the commission, the Public Service Commission, found, and I want to quote their finding, that there had been decades of similar deficiencies in mass shootings going all the way back to Columbine. So in hindsight and with that commission finding, how do you place blame on the former administration when the commission that that was formed for the very thing that puts you in office really mm -hmm. refutes that? Well, Glenn, that's a pretty deep question about how do I uh, dispute it. It's not my job. I'm not part of that commission. What I will tell you is having come into this organization and examined how grossly behind active shooter preparedness was and response protocols, investigative practices to ensure that kids aren't slaughtered in the schools, where there's multiple indicators. It was clear to me and my administration, which is comprised of decades of BSO uh, personnel, that we had advanced these training protocols and we had to invest millions of dollars to just get up to the current standards of making sure we don't allow students to die in a school. How do you feel that schools are safer now under your tenure? Absolutely. You know, we've invested millions of dollars in launching a real-time crime center where last year alone we tracked and monitored over 10,000 plus cameras in all our 256 plus public schools. And we stopped roughly 300 plus different interdictions in terms of crime patterns, 
uh, suspects running through campuses. And these things could have been done decades ago. It didn't have to wait. Uh, we didn't have to wait to lose 17 people to re reinvest technology and training into an agency that have a billion dollar budget. Yeah. Sheriff Tony, a couple of weeks ago, the men and women who work for you as both road deputies and the command staff lieutenants uh, had a vote of no confidence and 88 percent of the road deputies voted no confidence in you and among the lieutenants union uh, 85 percent voted no confidence now how can you successfully run this critical agency if uh, the majority of the men and women who vote for you uh, don't have confidence in your ability well first in terms of the, the volume of people that voted it has not been an entire agency but let's keep things in perspective here I came into this organization and has taken on every single use of force case, which my predecessor did not, and I've had to terminate employees. And that creates conflict. Conflict from an organization and, and union presidents and leadership who had grown accustomed to allowing deputies to brutally beat people. We, I heard Mr. Israel talk about my hesitation with the Karikovich case, the DeLuca Roll case. Well, he was in command of this organization from 2014 to 2019. And Deputy Krikovich had over 30 use of force cases, and all of them went unchecked, unverified, uh, no type of remedial training, no type of disciplinary action. We also had Deputy Sabrina, who beat a man in handcuffs, had over 27 use of force cases under Scott Israel's command. And so the idea that we are doing nothing, that I've waited six months, no. These men and women still will be afforded their due process, which is afforded to them under the law, but at the end of the day, they will be held accountable. I want to switch gears here a little bit, Sheriff. Well, you were here at the desk with us in March, right after you were uh, appointed and, and took office. And we had asked you how the politics of this office, as an elected office, changed the calculus of how you do law enforcement. And you told yeah. us that it shouldn't, but it does. So now that we're in a full-on election, how has the politics, being a politician, changed the way you operate, BSO, if it has? Glenn, I tell you, it hasn't changed, you know, my leadership approach of doing the operational things that are important for public safety. But what it has changed for me is in understanding that there are individuals, including Scott, who would resort to some of the most egregious allegations, uh, both from racist and derogatory statements to accuse me, a decorated officer of murder, when he understands the law, for his campaign to reference me as a nigger. These things are driven by politics, and that's disgusting. And I don't think this county appreciates any of those type of commentary when the conversation should be about. I just want to go on record that he, I just want to say he did not do this on this program. I'm not sure how to respond to that because that, that has no place on this program. Uh, but we will take that up. So, uh, Sheriff, I appreciate your time. We are always glad to be with you this morning. And this race, we might mention, has uh, at least seven other candidates as well. Uh, and so best of luck to everybody. All Thanks, right. Sheriff. We appreciate yeah, it. Thank you both. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank you. Up next, the firefighter who wants to go to Congress. First, he has to take on Miami-Dade's mayor, who is also running. Candidate Omar Blanco joins us when we come back. The race to represent South Miami-Dade and the Keys in Congress is now getting national attention because it is considered a toss-up district. Democrat Debbie Mukersal Powell is the incumbent there finishing her first term. Her opponent in November will be whoever wins the Republican primary on August 18th. Miami-Dade Mayor Carlos Jimenez is the front runner. His opponent, Omar Blanco, is a veteran Miami-Dade firefighter paramedic, past union president, and right here to make his case for Congress with us today. Good morning. Omar, good, good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, <laughs> good afternoon Michael and Glenna. So I just want to go on right. record as saying I know how tough it's been for you to get any kind of television time, newspaper time. COVID has over sort of shadowed everything. And right in the middle of COVID managing in the county is your opponent who gets lots of TV time. So why don't you just take a minute and make your case. What qualifies you to be a congressman? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I am a, uh, a lifelong Republican who's uh, lived in Miami-Dade all my life. I am a, a first responder, lieutenant, firefighter, paramedic here in Miami-Dade. My wife is a teacher in, in, in Miami-Dade and we're raising our two children right here. Uh, I think it's important that we elect someone who's going to be present and be a representative for the people of District 26. 
Uh, I've served as, uh, as you mentioned, for the, uh, the, as president of the firefighters for many years, and I fought uh, not only for the health and safety of our firefighters at all levels of government, but even for uh, for our community, getting life saving equipment and uh, and other important uh, public safety issues addressed here. I have experience working on legislation, uh, while my opponent does not. Omar, uh, we are living obviously through the greatest public health crisis in a hundred years in this country. Uh, and it is the main factor in this race. What has Carlos Jimenez done in dealing with the COVID-19 crisis that is wrong, or what would you have done differently? Well, listen, in, in my work as a uh, firefighter and a member of the urban search and rescue team that travels all over, uh, you know, having a command structure and collaboration and consensus and good old common sense are part of the decision-making process in, in any uh, any big major event, you know, unfortunately, my opponent has misled our community by put, placing the blame on local businesses, closing so our restaurants ability to survive themselves during this pandemic, which puts many of our constituents out of work. Uh, I believe that we've got to be able to get in front of the issues and not not necessarily pander, but serve. I mean, my experiences uh, as a first responder as I walk into these neighborhoods, I walk into these homes, I talk to the people, I see what they're experiencing. And they're tired of the same old political uh, games that are being played. Yeah, on, Omar, on are, are, excuse me. Are, are you saying that the mayor was wrong in following the advice of epidemiologists and other scientists who said that COVID-19 spreads easily in enclosed spaces like restaurants? Uh, should restaurants not have been closed to indoor dining? I, I, I 100 percent that our restaurants should be given the opportunity, just like they did in our neighbors to the north and south both in Broward County and Monroe counties, our restaurants are given the ability to have uh, the folks come in and eat. So yes, I do put that sole blame on our, uh, our on the mayor, my opponent. He hasn't been unable to work uh, collabor with, through collaboration and consensus with 34 municipalities uh, in Miami-Dade, and now he wants to go to Washington to work with 434 uh, congressmen and women. So, All right, so, yeah. so let's test the, the non-collaboration, because right now, those men and women in Washington have not been able to come to consensus on any kind of the next relief. So let's take a virtual congressional vote. What, how would you have voted? How, how, what would you do right now about the next round of relief that isn't happening yet? Would you extend more uh, the $600 a week federal pay? Would you do what the president did in, in an executive order because nothing else was happening? How would you protect future money and yet help people suffering right now? Well, and that's exactly the problem, Glenna. Listen, we, we see what's happening. Congress has a 20% approval rating, and that's clearly because there's no collaboration. And the president had to step in and sign four executive orders. Uh, I would work just as I did to pass cancer coverage for our firefighters here in the state of Florida. I would work across the aisle and work with all my uh, uh, colleagues to, to pass legislation and pass, you know, I would have, and you go back to your question, yes, I believe that we have to help those people in need. I think we have to make sure that we help people out of the system, not keep them in the system. And uh, that's what's important. That's what we're seeing on the front lines. We have people who are receiving funding who didn't necessarily need it, but we have people who need it, whose lives are dependent on it, and they are, uh, it's all being delayed because of the political rhetoric back and forth. So we need a, represent a representative that's gonna be present and be about the people. We the people of District 26, and that's my commitment to them. Omar Blanco, we are so glad to have you on our program. Wish you luck in the August 18th primary. We'll follow closely what happens. For the lightning Thank round, you. you've got the lightning round. <laughs> Omar, thanks so much. And Thank stay tuned, we'll be right back. Thank you so much for being with us today, and thanks to all of you who have inquired about why I am wearing this contraption. I had a shoulder surgery, but I'm recovering, doing well. Remember, stay informed, get involved. The bionic man gets another one. <laughs> Great to have you. We're online 24-7 at local10.com. Thanks for your time this morning. Great to be with you. Have a beautiful Sunday.